Well, I get as a pastor the unenviable task of trying to tell the same story in a different way every year. In fact, this is our 32nd year having Christmas services, and I really don't know how else to put Christmas after a while. But I hope that we can help you today to focus on that which matters. So if you have a Bible with you, would you please open it to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. And we're going to take a look at a couple of verses tonight, and then tomorrow morning for our three services on Sunday, we'll be looking at the third verse as well. Uh, Bob Bennett will be here to do worship for us tomorrow. We read in verse 4, Galatians 4.4, 4, these words. Paul said, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. There's certainly no better news than this. In fact, Jesus lived a life that no one else could have lived. And Paul points out three things that I think are very important about Christmas, and it, it doesn't have a manger scene in it, and there aren't wise men, and we're not going to a manger or out to a barn. But Paul says this, look, at the, at the right time, he put it this way, God in the fullness of time. At the right time, God sent the right person, his only son, for the right reasons to redeem man from the curse of the law under which he found himself. In very specific terms, Paul says these three things. Right time, right person, right reason. Any of you by any chance remember what happened December 17th, 1903? We had no takers for service either. I think if I tell you, though, you'll probably remember. There were two boys, young men from Dayton, Ohio, who met together at the sand dunes of Kitty Hark in North Carolina. And they had been planning this meeting for months. They owned a bike shop in Ohio. They had brought out a, as they described it, a machine that was heavier than air. But their plan was simple. We want to fly. That day, they did. And they were able to keep this thing up in the air for 12 seconds. They flew 120 feet. They couldn't have been happier. It became one of the, the most renowned, if you will, historical events of the century. And in their excitement, these boys sent to their sister Catherine a wire. And the wire said this, today we flew. Success, 120 feet without touching the ground comma, we'll be home for Christmas. Catherine, so excited, took the news and the, and the wire to the editor of the newspaper and said, read this with great excitement. And he kind of looked down at the, at the wire and he read it for a few seconds and he handed it back to her. And he said, oh, good. Your brothers will be home for Christmas. And she said, no. <laughs> they flew. And he absolutely read right by. Didn't get it at all. It was the news of the century, and they failed to pick up on it. And I think sometimes that's kind of the way Christmas comes and goes for us. You know, there is no greater news than God sending his son to save the world. But yet, in the midst of all of the busyness, that news is overshadowed by so many other things. Office parties and the man with the red suit, <laughs> the nativity scene that is set out just so. They miss out on the greatest news of, of history. I had the unfortunate luck of being across the street from the Braille Mall today at 1.30. <laughs> we went to Lazy Dog to eat, to eat lunch, and, and the place was empty, but that was the only place that was empty. The police were in the street, and they weren't allowing people to go into the parking lot, and I thought, it's 1.30 Christmas Eve. Who are you waiting to shop for? And if you love them so much, wouldn't you maybe gone earlier? I couldn't believe it. It took us 25 minutes to get out of the parking lot to Imperial Highway. 25 minutes. And I thought, here the greatest event in history is celebrated at Christmas. And most folks are missing it altogether. I read of a family a few years ago who had, had, had written an article about how they, part of their Christmas uh, practices each year was to go out with their young daughter and, and walk the neighborhood and look at all of the decorations. 
and they would ultimately end up at the church in town, which had the largest nativity scene of everyone. They had shepherds, and they had, they had this beautiful laid-out scene with the wise men and the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh. And, and that would be like the highlight. Every year they would stop and just kind of stare at this, at this beautiful scene, nativity scene, and, until a few years went by, and, and the little girl said to her dad, Hey, Dad, why does Jesus stay the same size every year? When will he grow up? And I thought, what a great question. So I hope that between tonight and tomorrow's church services, the Lord might grow up a little bit in your understanding of Christmas. That he might really take more shape and better shape in your heart so that the focus becomes really the person and the reason and the timing that he showed us. Because it's monumental truth, right? It is the most important news that man could hear. That God had a plan to save us eternally. That's a long time eternally. And Paul mentions it here, beginning with the words in verse 4, when the fullness of time came. Isn't it interesting to you that God had a time picked out? If you read the Old Testament, it covers about 4,000 years of history. And starting very early in the book of Genesis, God began to point out his plan. The prophets would come, the pictures would be painted, the signposts would be out, and every place you read, you'd see this hand going, he's over here, he's coming over there. And there would be this direction given to man that they wouldn't miss the son that was promised. God had a plan, and God had a time. 300 different scriptures written in, in, in all different centuries by men who never knew each other, all pointing and giving a part of the picture until you put them all together and you couldn't miss him. Daniel went so far as to point out the exact day that he would ride into town on a donkey to proclaim himself to be the Messiah that had been promised. The Passover lamb, the one that would be born in Bethlehem to a virgin as a descendant of David. I mean, everything was just so. It was God's right timing. And everything pointed to it for 4,000 years. And Christmas celebrates the fact that God had a plan and that timing was his. And maybe tonight is the timing for you to know him has come. We are told that in the right time, verse 4, God sent forth his son. Not only was the timing right, the person was right. You know that no one has ever influenced the world like Jesus Christ? No one. Not even close. There's lots of literary, you know, men that have come and gone. Wise men, Aristotle taught for 40 years. Plato taught for 50 years. Socrates followed for 40 more. And for 130 years, the Greek philosophers own the, 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 the knowledge and wisdom set for the world. And they can't even come close to the wisdom that Jesus laid out in three and a half years of his public life. And his influence overshadows them all. You know, when I was growing up, we used to have encyclopedias. In fact, we'd buy one a month. And it, talk, it took a lot of money. I remember my dad saying, these are expensive. And we'd buy them all. But the, there are still some encyclopedias that are online that are good. Encyclopedia Britannica is certainly one of them. But if you go look up Jesus, there are over 20,000 words written about his life alone. It's a lot of literary real estate. It's more than Aristotle and Alexander the Great and Buddha and Caesar and Cicero and Confucius and the prophet Muhammad combined. And it should be so. He has singularly touched the world far more than any other combination of any bunch of men. I read a couple of weeks ago a man say, Christmas is when God came down the stairs of heaven with a baby in his arms. The Bible would say, God came down the stairs of heaven with a Savior in his arms. Because that's what we need. So God, at the exact time that he had been speaking about for 4,000 years, sent his son. Sent the right person, the right time, the right person. That popular song that you can hear on the radio these days, uh, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, was written by Irving Berlin in the early 40s. But he really didn't sing very well. He wrote well. And Bing Crosby sang that song for years. In fact, as of this week, it had sold over 110 million copies. That's ridiculous, isn't it? I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. I'll tell you what, if the Lord had written the song, he would have said, I'm dreaming of a red one. Because if you want your sins forgiven, washed, you're going to have to go to him first. It was Isaiah who, who, who had the Lord speaking through him and saying, come and let us reason together your sins, even if they're scarlet. They can be white as snow. If they're chrism, they can be like wool. 
But God made this promise of cleansing us. According to the law, Paul would write to the Hebrews, everything is purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness for sin. At the right time, God sent the right person. As Paul, in this book of Galatians, reviews the history of the Jews, the nation, and their relationship to God, Paul goes out of his way to say to these religious folks, look, the law has never allowed you to perform very well. It's shown you where you've failed. It can't really help you to accomplish your desire to worship God. So why don't you grow up? And why don't you come and turn now to a new relationship that God is making available through his grace by the work that he sent his son to do? Get to the freedom part that God will bring. In the first three verses of Galatians 4, Paul says this. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, doesn't differ at all from a slave, though he's the master of all. He is under guardians and stewards until the time that's been appointed by his father. Well, we also, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. But when the fullness of time came, God set his son. Paul's argument's pretty simple. He said, you know, if you're the inheritor of your father's estate and you're a kid, you don't understand money and inheritance. You're kind of like the slave. Oh, you, you're the master of all, but, but you live the same way because you lack understanding. And then he uses that as a spiritual analogy and says to us, there's really no way to find life until you meet Jesus. No way to be free from the power of sin in your life until you meet this one that God had sent. At the right time, God sent the right person. And there's a couple of things that we should take note of because it's Christmas. Verse four says that he sent his son. He sent forth his son. Let me say this to you. The person that came that we celebrate on Christmas was sent from God. It doesn't say at the right time God bore a son or birthed a son or made a son or created a son. He said he sent forth his son. They are present tense terms, but they imply the same thing. Jesus was around before he was born. It implies pre-existence. The father sent someone who was already in his presence. The word sent forth is where we get the word apostle from. But it means to, to, to be sent with a message or to be an ambassador on a mission. Did you know that Jesus is the only person that was around before he was born? He was around before he was born. He lived before he was born. Now, don't think about that too long because it'll drive you nuts. It's hard to wrap your head around some of these you know, eternal things. But, but it says to us for sure and that, that he was there before he came. In other words, he pre-existed. Christmas is the celebration of God sending forth his son. And the Bible in every place confirms that Jesus was around before he was born. At the end of his ministry, when he is heading to the Garden of Gethsemane, he stops to pray with the disciples. And he says there in John chapter 17, verse 5, Father, would you glorify me with yourself with the same glory that I had with you before the world was. He looked around and 20 verses later in that same prayer, he said, Father, I, I desire that they whom you have given me may be with me where I am, that they might behold my glory, which you've given me because you've loved me from the foundation of the world. Wherever you turn, you find Jesus speaking about that life before his birth. But Christmas celebrates the giving of this son. He said in John chapter 8, if, if God were your father to these religious men, you'd love me. I came from the Father. I didn't come of myself. He sent me. He said in chapter 6 of John, I've come to do the will, not of myself, but of him who sent me. The person that we celebrate on Christmas came from God. I'm sure you've heard the term culture shock. I don't know if you've ever traveled out of the country, but if you go to India or you go to places in Africa that are very poor, you can't help but just feel like, my goodness, how can people live this way? We have missionaries that are stationed in very difficult parts of the country, and sometimes they don't come home for a couple of years, and when they come home, they usually have a, a tremendously difficult time seeing how Americans spend their money. They say, what a waste, and how could you buy that? And Who needs that kind of stuff? We barely get by with these things. And it's a real culture shock. Unfortunately, it doesn't stay with you very long. And they fall back into those same old habits. But imagine the culture shock that Jesus faced when he left heaven to come here. There's an old hymn that says, out from the ivory palaces into the world of woe. 
Well, at just the right time, God sent just the right person, the only one he would ever send into the world, a savior, because that's what we needed. You know, if we would need information, God could have sent us an educator. If, we, if our greatest need was a, money, he could have sent us an economist. But our greatest need is forgiveness. So God sends his son. He's been planning it for years. It is time to reveal him now. That's what Christmas is all about. He sent his son. He was with him. Secondly, verse 4 says that the son that he sent was called the son of God. He's the son of God. God sent forth his son. Now, that's a, that's a mystery. <laughs> In fact, Paul, when he wrote to Timothy, said, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And then he said, God was made known in the flesh. It, it's a mind blower. God made himself known to us in the flesh. God became a man. And the question is obvious, how does God become a man? And my answer is, I have no idea. I always like how people ask you questions that are unanswerable. I had a guy the other day in, in, in church, and he, and he said, hey, when do you think the Lord's coming back? And I said, well, you know, the Bible says no man knows the day or the hour, so I don't know. He goes, yeah, I know, but when do you think he's coming back? I said, I, I don't know. You know, I don't know. But I do know this. The Son of God implies that Jesus shares with his Father the same nature. If, if the Father is God then Jesus is God. And whenever you read the word Son of God in a singular way in the Bible, it always speaks of Jesus being God in a human body. Even his enemies understood that, that that was his claim. Read John chapter 10, and, and they, they, the, these enemies pick up stones to stone Jesus. And Jesus said, look, I've shown you a lot of works from my Father. For which one are you going to stone me? And they said, oh, we're not going to stone you for any of those good works. We're going to stone you because you're a man. And yet you claim to be God. Well, he claimed to be God because he was God. A couple of weeks ago on Sunday mornings as we've been going through Mark, Jesus pulled these religious men aside who knew the Bible very well, and he said, well, you know, the Messiah, when he comes, who, whose son will he be? And they said, well, he'll be the son of David, and they handed him Psalm 110, verse 1. And Jesus said, well, if he's, if he's the son of David, how does David call him his Lord? You know, in, in a patriarchal society, the father would never call his son his Lord. But, but he put his finger on that very same thing. Here's God's son sent, but he's more than a man. He's God in the flesh. I know there's always confusion with folks, and you'll hear it sometimes. You'll say, well, I read in the Bible that it says, you know, I and my father are one. And then I read Jesus saying, my father is greater than I am. Well, what's the truth? And the answer is, they're both true. You know, when Jesus was born, remember, he was given by the father born of a woman, Jesus emptied himself of his godhood prerogatives. Didn't stop being God, just wasn't going to rely on that to live. So he's our perfect example. You live by the Holy Spirit to, to lead you, to guide you, to speak to you. So did Jesus. He depended upon the Holy Spirit to do great things, to reveal to him, him, to him the, the word of God and the will of God. He became our example. He's fully God. He's also fully man. One of the kids was, was sharing Isaiah 9 passage about unto us a child is born. That's usually what Christmas is to most people, the, the baby Jesus. But they never get to and unto us a son has been given. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. And, and, and we hear it from both sides. Even in his conception, you know, when the angel came to Mary and said, Mary, you found favor with God, and, and you're going to conceive in your womb, and you're going to bring forth a son, and you're going to name him Jesus, and he's going to be great, son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end, and he's just going on, and Mary goes, time out. Yeah, maybe you don't know I'm a virgin, and I'm not married, and I don't see how that's going to happen, and how can that be? And then the angel said, it's the Holy Spirit who will come upon you and overshadow you of the highest and the Holy One born to you will be called the Son of God. He'll be God's Son. Why did God send His Son? Because He wanted to communicate to you His love and His plan. Because He wanted to save you from your sin. You know, Plato, that smart guy, wrote in many of his essays, God and man can never meet. The gods have nothing to do with man. Well, he has to go to the back of the class. He's wrong. Because God said he sent his son to reach out for me. In fact, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. 
At the right time, God sent forth the right person. Sent him forth from heaven, sent forth his son, who became a human and took human flesh. 100% God, 100% man. But if you want to check out what God thinks, just look at Jesus. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. So when you see him healing a blind man, you should know that God is very compassionate. And when he's teaching the crowds, you should know that he's very concerned that you know the truth. When he weeps over Jerusalem, that he is a God that is brokenhearted when you decide to try to live without him. When he's dying on the cross, he's a determined God not to give you away so easily. He'll give all that he can to be sure that, you've, that you're one, that you're in, that you've been redeemed. Jesus tells us God is not aloof in heaven, untouched by the world he's made, but he feels our pain, and so he comes to earth, and he knows what we're going through, and he leaves all of the glory of heaven, and he comes here, but he brings with him the resources to help us. At the right time, God sent forth the right person. He was the Son of God, but there's more. He was also fully man. So Paul writes here in verse 4, he sent forth his Son who was born of a woman and born of under the law. Here the emphasis is not on his deity, but he's on his humanity. The Son of God had a human birth. At the right time, culturally and prophetically and, and, and politically, in the fullness of time, God sends his only son, Jesus, the God-man larger than the universe he created, but he confines him to the womb of a teenage Jewish girl. And he places him in a position where he has to be born and it's an amazing thought that in Bethlehem on that day in a barn filled with animals, they laid him in a feeding trough. He's the maker of all, and he takes the form of this helpless, dependent newborn who came for one purpose, to redeem man. The Father sent him so that you and I could go to heaven. In the right time, he sent the right person, the Son of God, born of a woman. Look, Jesus had to have a miraculous birth if he was going to save us. If he had been born of Joseph, he would have been born a sinner like us. All have sinned. But he wasn't born that way. He was born of the Father. So you read born of a woman. You don't read born of a man. Because if he were not God, we would be doomed. If he, if he wasn't fully God, he couldn't give his life for our sins. If he didn't fully obey the law, perfectly so, we'd have no hope. But notice Paul says, born of a woman. The Savior comes at Christmas, that's why we celebrate. And he was born under the law. You know, Jesus was born a Jewish young boy, circumcised on the eighth day, because that's what you did. Dedicated at the temple, raised in a home where the, the Torah and the Tanakh were, were, were taught. He would pray to the God of Israel. He would go to the synagogue regularly. He was under obligation to keep the law and obey God's word. But unlike everyone else, he did it. Fully so. Fully so. And the reason is very clear, verse 5. He did it to redeem those who of us who are under the law so that we might be adopted as his children. That's the reason we have Christmas. That's the best news in town, isn't it? That God planned for 4,000 years a way whereby you could be saved. It would just cost him everything, his son. He would come to die, fully God, fully man. And because he didn't sin, he could die for our sins. And we have plenty of those, don't we? and he could stand in the gap. God sent his son. God did not send Santa Claus. Now, I've got nothing against Santa Claus. He's never done me wrong. <laughs> Although he sent me lots of threats as a kid. But I do remember that even when I was naughty, I got gifts, so I think he was bluffing. I've told you, I think, before, maybe some of you remember, that there was a real Santa Claus. In, in Holland, where I grew up, they called him Sinterklaas. They have celebrated this saint for generations. His real name was Nicholas. He, he grew up and was well known as the Bishop of Mycia, which was a place that today would be in Turkey. And he was known for his generosity. He gave almost all that he had to the poor. He would make sure that in the name of Jesus it would be left on people's doorsteps. He was a member of, of, of one of the most important things, at least in church history. He was a member of the Council of Nicaea, where they eventually wrote the Nicene Creed. The, this is what we believe about the Bible and what God teaches us about his son. And it was written because there was a guy named Arius at the time who was running around in 325 AD saying, Jesus isn't God. In, in fact, at the Nicene 
uh, meetings when Arius stood up and said that, old St. Nicholas walked over and slapped him in the face. I like old St. Nick. Way to go, buddy. Said, don't blaspheme my God. <laughs> He's more than a fat guy and with a beard and red clothes. He loved Jesus and served him faithfully. That's what Christmas is for us. You know, there are some of us tonight amongst you that are celebrating Christmas this year without a husband for the first time and a wife or a child. And were it not for what Jesus had done, I wouldn't know what to say to you, except I'm sorry. But that would hardly help. But what I can say to you tonight is, hang in there. <laughs> in the end, we all get gathered together again because of who Jesus is. And we'll see your wife, and we'll see your husband, and we'll see your children again. There's great hope for us because of Christmas. Don't miss the news that we fly <laughs> just because the kids are coming home to eat. Don't miss the great news that God saves just because the mall was so busy this year. God has made a promise. And he'll stand at the door of your heart. He'll knock to, to get in. He, he won't kick the door in, but he'll, he's pretty persistent. And maybe you've never really considered him as the Bible presents him to you. Or maybe you've walked away from him and you shouldn't have, and you should come back to where he is. Maybe some of you are here tonight because your family dragged you. You're trying to keep them happy. This is part of their Christmas present. You in church, way to go. I trust that God brought you here because he wants you to know his son. That's really what Christmas is all about. And you can give your life to him. All you have to do is ask. Ultimately, your responsibility is pretty small. Agree with God that you're sinful. Thank God that he provided a way out by his son coming to die in your place. That's really what the gospel's all about. And the minute you do that, God will do the rest. He always has. That's what Christmas is for. Father, as we sit together this evening with great thanksgiving for your goodness, may you remind us again, especially in just the hour that we get to sit here, that, that Lord, you had a plan from the beginning to save man. That, that you saw those that you had made falling into sin and what it would do to them, and you had a plan in place that would redeem man from the sinfulness that was destroying his life. And for us that are sitting here tonight, those of us who, who know you and love you, Lord, we, we can't help but think about Christmas in those terms. That, Lord, you have brought us to that place where we recognize that Christmas exists because you're a good, loving God. You spoke for, for generations of a promise to save. You, you sent a son at the right time. He's the only one that could have saved. He's the God-man. And he lived perfectly, and he died for our sins, and he rose to give life to those who'd call upon his name. And the sin for us one day is certainly going to be, if we don't receive you and your love, that, that we set aside the only hope that we had. And we trampled under our feet the sacrifice of the son that you sent. Look, consider tonight for a couple of minutes where you stand with God. And what Christmas then means to you. To him, it meant the fulfillment of his word. It meant the open door for man to be forgiven. It, it meant that his love could be put on full display. It meant that we wouldn't have to die in our sins or, or, or see death as that final place of defeat. He came to give life. And to those who would call upon his name, life would be given. So I want to invite you to think about putting your life in his hands so that this Christmas the, the gift that you'll most treasure will be the one that you recognize God sent on your behalf it's the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> it, it'll give you eternal life and a peace that the world doesn't understand and a joy that nothing else can give at the right time God sent the right person his son to redeem us <laughs> to buy us who had fallen into sin so that we could no longer just be children of sin, we could be children of God. Thank God for Christmas. And if you'll ask him to be the Lord tonight, if you'll pray that prayer of just, Lord, forgive me and save me, God will do that. And then in a few minutes when we dismiss, some of our pastors will be up front. And they would love to pray with you and we'd love to give you some Bible studies to take home so that you might um, 
be assured that God means what he says. Not because, hey, that pastor said that, but because, hey, the Bible tells me so. So tonight, as you sit there before the Lord, if he's moving on your heart to come back to him or come to him, would you come and tell one of the pastors before you go home and let them give you some some good Bible studies to take home and work on on your own so that you might be encouraged. Shall we stand and sing this last song together tonight?